Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about chronic myeloid leukemia or CML. In this lesson we're going to talk about how we can distinguish this type of leukemia from other types of leukemia. We're also going to talk about the pathogenesis of CML involving the Philadelphia chromosome. And we're also going to talk about the signs and symptoms and treatment of CML. So chronic myeloid leukemia is one type of leukemia and its name allows us to distinguish it from other types of leukemia. It is a myeloproliferative disorder that presents with increased granulocytic cell line proliferation. Granulocytic cells are neutrophils, and that's where the term myeloid actually comes from. And these cells still have the ability to differentiate. So they can be differentiated mature neutrophils. That's where the term chronic comes from. And if we were to take a look at a peripheral blood film, we can see a lot of mature white blood cells, a lot of mature neutrophils. And we can tell that they're mature because their nucleus is large in proportion to their cytosol. So that's what chronic myeloid leukemia is, high levels of mature neutrophils. So a quick approach to determining the type of leukemia, again, if we see increased white blood cells, often very high, and they're mature white blood cells, that means it's a chronic leukemia, and it's PMNs or neutrophils, that means it's myeloid, so it's CML. That is a quick approach to determining that a leukemia is actually a chronic myeloid leukemia. So the epidemiology of CML generally can occur at any age, but most commonly occurs in middle age to older adults and generally ages between 60 and 65 years. So the pathophysiology of CML has to do with what we call the Philadelphia chromosome. And the Philadelphia chromosome is the product of chromosome 9 and chromosome 22 translocation. So what happens is that on chromosome 9 we have a proto-oncogene known as c able or just able, and this piece of chromosome 9 can be plopped off and can be swapped for a piece on chromosome 22, so a translocation. And what can happen is the piece here from chromosome 9 can be put onto chromosome 22 with the gene ABLE right next to the gene BCR. So after the chromosomes swap pieces with each other can lead to a changed chromosome 22, what we call a Philadelphia chromosome, with the genes BCR and ABLE next to each other. And this leads to the formation of a fusion gene known as BCR ABLE, which can produce a new protein, also called BCR ABLE. And the problem with this protein is that it is an active tyrosine kinase. There is no regulation on this protein, and that's not what we want. We want to have proper regulation. And what happens is, because this is continuously active, this protein can actually activate JAK-STAT pathways and ras raf mec erk pathways, both of which lead to increase in cell survival and proliferation, not what we want. So that's the pathophysiology of CML. So CML presents in about three different clinical phases. The first one is what we call chronic phase, and chronic phase is where majority of individuals are diagnosed, and it's around 80 to 85%. And this is when they present with less than 10% of blast cells. They may have slightly increased eosinophils and basophils at this stage, but generally this stage is often asymptomatic. The next phase is accelerated phase, and this is when neutrophil differentiation becomes impaired. Remember I said that neutrophils still have the ability to differentiate. Well, in this phase, that differentiation ability starts to become impaired. And this is when we have about 10 to 19% of circulating blast cells. And we also see it increase in basophils at this time. The increase in basophil count can actually lead to a puritis, so itching. And we also start to see thrombocytopenia at this time because some of the cells in bone marrow begin to crowd out other cells. And generally we start to see constitutional symptoms in splenomegaly in this uh, phase as well. And the splenomegaly is caused by an increase uh, in extramedullary hematopoiesis. What that means is that because the bone marrow starts to become crowded out by white blood cells, other parts of the body have to kind of make up for it. Um, 
in order to keep producing enough red blood cells. So the spleen starts to produce red blood cells um, as an extra medullary process. The third phase is what we call a blast crisis. This is when there are greater than 20% of blast cells. And blast cells themselves, again, fail to differentiate. And oftentimes, this is when CML can convert to another type of leukemia. Oftentimes, it's acute myeloid leukemia, so AML, and um, less often, ALL. So what are the signs and symptoms of CML? Again, most individuals at diagnosis are asymptomatic. They present in that chronic phase, but when they become symptomatic, there are a few main symptoms and signs I want you to remember. Splenomegaly is one of the biggest ones, and splenomegaly is the enlargement of the spleen. This is the most common physical finding in CML, and it presents with early satiety, so they get full a little quicker than they used to. So you can imagine if you're having an increased spleen, it starts to push up against your stomach, and you can't eat as much. That's why you get early satiety. And you also can get left upper quadrant pain simply because of the enlarging of the tissue. And another common finding, which is actually several symptoms, are the constitutional symptoms. And in CML, they're often mild. These can include fatigue, malaise, fever, weight loss, excessive sweating. So they just generally don't feel well. There's just something that is not right. And another sign that's interesting with CML is tenderness over the lower sternum. And this is because of expanding bone marrow. Other symptoms uh, that aren't as specific for CML include anemia, simply because the bone marrow is being crowded out. There can be bleeding due to thrombocytopenia. There can be pruritus due to increased uh, basophils. There can be leukostasis, and there can be priapism in males. For investigations and diagnosis of CML, again, we look at a CBC, we have high white blood cell count, we have high basophil count, and we often can have decrease in red blood cells, so they're anemic and they're thrombocytopenic. On peripheral film, like that we talked about before, the peripheral film is used to determine if it's mature or immature white blood cells, and in this case, it's mature white blood cells. And a bone marrow biopsy is used to determine the percentage of blast cells so we can categorize what phase they're in. And for diagnosis, the diagnosis is quite simple for CML. It's just having evidence of BCR able fusion product or Philadelphia chromosome. They can use immunofluorescence and other tests to determine this if there is a BCR able fusion product. Treatment is with imatinib. And imatinib is targeting that uh, tyrosine kinase. So it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And this is kind of easy for um, remembering because CML, CML is always imatinib. So we always use imatinib to treat. There are second generation inhibitors of BCR able or second generation uh, TKIs or tyrosine kinase inhibitors due to uh, drug resistance to imatinib. These include desatinib and nalotinib. So what happens generally is a patient gets treated with imatinib and what happens is the cancer can mutate and can actually mutate resistance to imatinib. So that BCR able protein can actually mutate to avoid uh, inhibition by imatinib. So this is why we can move on to using some of these other second generation inhibitors. And just to quickly talk about prognosis, to determine prognosis for patients with CML, we can use a couple of different scores. We can use a SoCal prognostic score, which looks at spleen size, percentage blasts, age, platelet count, and a kind of a newer score that's been used to determine the efficacy and prognosis with imatinib treatment is the Utah score. A bit simpler because it only looks at a couple of different things. Again, spleen size and percentage basophils. So these both can um, give you prognostic scores. There's online calculators 
for these to help you with a prognosis for patients with CML. I hope you found this lesson helpful. That was a lesson on CML. If you did find this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And also check out my other videos on my channel, including a lot of other hematology videos that I continually upload as well. So thank you so much, and I hope to see you next time.